Okay, hi there, it's Margie from Hush Education and this is the final video in the series that I've been making. Today we're going to talk about reproduction, which is basically talking all about babies. We'll talk about conception, which is how babies are made. We'll talk about pregnancy, which is how babies grow and develop inside their uh, parents' uterus. And we'll also be talking about birth, how the baby gets out of the mum's body as well. Now today I am very much winging it so I hope we do okay and it's quite a long video so you might feel like you want to have a break in between. This is although a video for children definitely one that grown-ups, parents, carers might want to have a little look at first just to check that all the information fits in with what their family wants their own children to know about and again, I'd love it if you can sit down and watch it with the child um, when you bring the time around for them to have a look at it too. Just before we get started, and when I do start, I'll review a little bit of what we've spoken about previously. I want to show you some really good books, some of the books that I enjoy using and um, sharing with parents as we have our parent and family evenings as well. So the first one I've got here is called the amazing true story of how babies are made. This is a local Australian book. It's available for a very reasonable price in places like Kmart, for instance. A um, little bit gendered, but otherwise a great, funny, frank story of about how babies are made, where babies come from. So that's a good one to start with. Another one that I really, really enjoy. And this is about a lot more than just reproduction and babies. This one is called Tell Me About Sex Grandma. I love the fact that the people in this story are people of colour. Um, it talks about sexuality, it talks about diversity, it talks about um, just making sure that children can have that conversation in a way that is comfortable for them and also for the adults they might be talking to as well. Um, I really do like the fact that it's grandma giving the advice and I do know that's quite common in a lot of different cultures around the world as well. So it's Tell Me About Sex Grandma. It's written and illustrated by Anastasia Higginbotham. The next one I love is called An Incredible Journey. And this is about IVF, which is always an important conversation to have, particularly if your family is an IVF family as well. And this one just goes through the whole journey, just explaining how the process works. It's a rhyming storybook for younger children, very simplified, very age appropriate. So it's called An Incredible Creation, my I, sorry, My Incredible Creation, an IVF Journey uh, by Julian Dubon and illustrated by Jennifer Dumont. So it's their own story. Next one I have, good old favourite, I'm sure you've all seen it and heard about it before, Where Did I Come From? I still find that younger children in particular and perhaps people who are not so big on reading prefer to have a little bit of a, a visual storytelling, really do love this book. It does cover all the basic facts about making love, um, even about orgasm, conception, the growth inside the uterus uh, right up till the actual birth. But because it is from way back in the 70s, there's not a lot of information, for instance, about IVF. So it's a good starter book. It's great, very basic information, but I do enjoy it. I always enjoy these books. Next one I've got, great book. It's called What Makes a Baby? And the thing I love most about this book is completely non-gendered. And as we're becoming more and more aware over the um, last few years in particular, we are moving away from using some of those terms like woman and man when it comes to reproduction and babies because more and more people are choosing to perhaps uh, live in a birth, uh, uh, sorry, a gender that was not assigned to them at birth. So this one really makes that uh, a good way to talk about that as well. Next one, enjoy for older people is called Let's Talk About Sex. And again, this is sort of a really great sort of what we might call pre-teens, perhaps about 11, 12 and up to just find out some information in a really 
easy way to approach those talks that people need to have. And it's very comfortable, it's very positive. It's a great starting point. Again, as a, a grown up, if you want to read this first, it really helps you begin some of those discussions you're going to have over the next few years as well. Next one, an all time favorite for a lot of people. It's called, It's Not the Stalk. Now, of course, the person who wrote this book also wrote It's Perfectly Normal and It's So Amazing. Um, and that person is Roby Harris. This is a brilliant book because it talks about a whole lot more than just reproduction as well. It answers nearly every question about birth, about babies, about bodies, about families, about healthy sexuality. Um, you can't go wrong. If you wanted to buy just one book for your children of all different ages, to talk about reproduction and bodies, It's Not the Stalk is a really great choice. But I love It's Perfectly Normal and It's So Amazing as well. The last one I was going to talk about today, we mentioned it in our puberty program or puberty talks earlier on, and it's just called Hair in Funny Places. Again, it's an older book. It's quite a gendered book, but it just reminds particularly young children a little bit of that information about why puberty is happening, how it leads to our next topic, which might be when we start to talk about reproduction and babies as well. Okay, I'll put them down and we'll get started. And I've got some pictures to show today, some photographs of uh, pregnancy and birth. I've also got some little resources here I'll be using as well. Now, over the last few videos, this is number six, we spoke about bodies. We spoke about the very common physical changes that occur to everybody as they go through this stage called puberty. We talked about what we call some of the sex specific changes, the ones that happen to people who have a uterus and a vagina, the ones that happen to people who have a penis and testicles. We talked about the social emotional aspects of puberty, which is a really important thing to remember because some people leave that out when they have those discussions. And you know, the really interesting thing of all of those talks that we've had up to this stage is remembering that the reason children go through puberty, that children grow up and become adults is because their bodies are becoming capable in most cases of reproduction. Their bodies become capable of creating a baby and in some cases of carrying and birthing a baby as well. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to start off, just a little reminder, somewhere between the ages of about eight or nine and 16, young people will notice that their bodies are starting to change and we call that change puberty. Remember, it's not just bodies, it's also the way people think, feel, the way that people relate to others as well. Now, for people who have a uterus, a vagina, that puberty means that they will begin to ovulate and they will begin to have periods, which we spoke about just a couple of videos ago as well. Now, ovulation is the word we use when an egg cell, which is stored in the ovaries, is released from the ovary, travels down the fallopian tubes, heading towards the uterus. There are about 400,000 of these tiny grain of sand sized egg cells in the ovaries when a young person gets to the age of about 9, 10, right up to somewhere at 15 and 16. So when puberty is starting for a person who has a uterus, that is their entire egg supply for the rest of their lives. And that was developing as that baby developed inside their own mum's body. Remember we said ovulation is the egg cell leaves the, the ovary, travels down the fallopian tube, heading towards the uterus. And it's doing this just in case it is going to be joined by a sperm cell. Usually that doesn't happen, particularly when we're talking about younger people and puberty. And that egg cell, egg cell dissolves, it goes away, and that young person would have their period when the lining inside their uterus that was created as a safe place for a baby to grow comes away and comes out of the body. 
Now, for people who have a penis and have testicles, puberty is the time when sperm production begins. And sperm are what we call the male sex cells, or just sex cells, whereas egg cells or ovum we call the female sex cells, or just sex cells. In bodies with a penis and testicles, millions and millions of microscopic sperm cells are produced in the testicles every single day. Now you might remember I called the testicles a sperm-making factory, because basically that's what they are. Okay. So conception, babies, how do they start? How are they made? Every single human baby so far starts in the same way because the only way to create a human baby is to join together two cells. One of them is that egg cell we spoke about. The other is the sperm cell. When these two cells join together, we call it fertilization, or we call it conception, and that is the beginning of a baby. Now, these tiny cells always eventually end up growing into the baby inside part of the body called the uterus. So far, scientists haven't worked out another way to grow a baby completely outside a human body. When the sperm enter the female body or the body with the vagina and the uterus, there are millions and millions and millions of them. And the interesting thing is that all of these sperm have a job to do, but only one of these sperm is going to be the cell that starts the baby growing. Do you know the most common way for that egg cell and that sperm cell to join together is when two people have sex. We might call it sexual intercourse, we might call it making love. Also quite common is a process that's called IVF. And IVF, or in vitro fertilization, is where there is some external help with getting those cells to join together. This might happen with the assistance of a doctor or a scientist. The cells may be joined outside the body in a petri dish and then inserted through the vagina into the uterus or the sperm may be inserted in a different way as well. But as I said, the most common way for those two cells to join together to meet each other is when two adults have sexual intercourse. And today, because we're talking about reproduction, I'm going to talk about sexual intercourse between a person with a penis and a person with a vagina. For sexual intercourse to take place, two adults will be feeling close and loving towards each other. They will find a private place to have sex and most often they will remove all or some of their clothing. They will lie down together and have their bodies almost joined together. The female or the vagina accepts the penis and the bodies move together. It's a very, very enjoyable activity, it feels good, it has pleasant sensations, the movements can be fast, the movements can be slow, the position of the bodies can be different at different times, and after varying amounts of time, the sperm comes shooting out the end of the penis. Remember we said sperm are microscopic cells, you can't see them, but they're mixed with a fluid called semen, a clear or a milky white fluid. And this semen and sperm leaves the penis, it enters the body through the vagina, it's right up near the cervix, which we spoke about in our first session. And that sperm is going to travel the length of the vagina through the cervix into the uterus, heading towards the fallopian tubes. And those sperm are hoping to meet up with an egg cell, which will only be there in the time that the person with the ovaries has ovulated. So if there's an egg cell available, the sperm might join with that egg cell and a baby would start to grow. You know, a baby does not start every single time adults have sexual intercourse. And adults have sex for lots of different reasons. Adults have sex to show that they love each other and they're committed to each other. Adults have sex for pleasure 
because sex is something that feels good. It's a way of sharing intimacy. Adults also have sex when they're hoping to make a baby for reproduction purposes. But you know, we can't really talk about sex unless we have a little talk about some of the rules, some of the laws that go with this topic. It's one of the reasons it's a discussion for people to have continuing as they get a little bit older as well. In Victoria, in Australia, where we are, various states have laws or rules about sex and about sexual touching. The law says that sex must always be a choice. Someone has said, yes, this is something that I want to do. This is the way I want to do it. This is the person that I want to do it with. It's against the law to force anyone or make anyone to have sex or to touch anyone in a sexual way if they haven't consented or said yes. Sex is for grown-ups. It's for people who not only have a mature body, a body that's been all the way through puberty, but it's also for people who are old enough to understand the laws, the rules, and also the consequences of being in a sexual relationship. They understand that it's possible for a baby to start. They understand that it's always going to be their choice that someone older or someone stronger or more powerful is not able to force them or encourage them or make them have sex, which is why we say it's for grown-ups. Sex is always supposed to be shared in private. It's not a public activity. It's not something that other people need to see. Usually any activity that involves nudity or nakedness is a private activity. You know, the people who belong to the same family, unless they're the parents or the partners in that family, would never have sex with each other. Sex is against the law if it's a parent or a sibling with a child in a family. And the last one is sex really is about equality. It is a rule that no one who is caring for you or looking after you or supervising you or even responsible for you can have sex with you and they can't touch you in a sexual way or speak to you in a sexual way. It's against the law. So that means if you had someone like a teacher, a sports coach, a doctor, for instance, they would not be allowed to be in a sexual relationship with another person. So that's a little bit about how babies are made, the part that we call conception. You know, the typical pregnancy goes somewhere from about 37 weeks, that's about nine months, up to around 42 weeks. So anywhere within that sort of five weeks is quite a, an average time for a baby to be born after it's been growing and developing inside mum's uterus. When a person becomes pregnant, one of the things that happens is that their periods will most often stop. So if someone is trying to become pregnant, trying to start a baby and their period stopped, that might be one of the good indications that pregnancy has occurred. Other signs of pregnancy inc include people's breasts becoming quite tender and sore. The nipples get darker. Their body is preparing to produce milk in the milk ducts inside the breasts. About 50% of people when they're pregnant experience something that we call morning sickness. The tricky thing about that is that it's not always in the morning. Sometimes people can feel sick in the evening or throughout the day. And it's a feeling of nausea. It's a sign that strong pregnancy hormones, new hormones are coursing around the body. When people are pregnant, they begin to wee more often, increased urination, because as the uterus grows with the baby inside it, you can push on the bladder and other parts of the body people need to go to the toilet more often. When people are pregnant, they might become a little bit more tired than usual. They might be hungry more than usual. They may even start to crave some interesting or different types of foods and things to put in their mouths and eat. Of course, the best way to diagnose a pregnancy is a positive pregnancy test. And this is sort of a stick that has some special chemicals in it. And when some of the pregnant person's urine goes on the stick, those hormones in the urine, the pregnancy hormones, react with the chemicals and it says, yep, 
this person is pregnant. It might be a smiley face. It might be two little lines. There's all different types of pests that people can have. Now, I think I said to you that when the sperm enter the body through the vagina during sexual intercourse, there are millions and millions and millions of them. And these microscopic sperm, remember they're too tiny to see without a microscope, travel the length of the vagina through the uterus and into the fallopian tubes. And some of those sperm get tired out. They can't complete the journey. Some of those sperm die along the way. Some of those sperm are the wrong shape or the wrong size and they're not able to fertilize an egg cell. Some of those sperm take a wrong turn. They might end up in the other fallopian tube where there's no egg cell waiting for them. Eventually, a number of the sperm cells make it to the egg cell. And even though only one sperm joins with the egg, all of those other sperm do have an important job to do. And I've got a photo here to show you how it works. I love this photo. To me, it looks a little bit like a planet. And what we have here is an egg cell. It's a photo that's been made much, much, much bigger. And all around the egg cell, you can see the tiny sperm. So remember, in real life, this egg cell is the size of a single grain of sand. It shows you how tiny these are. So all of these sperm are bumping their little sperm heads into the outer layer of the egg cell. They're breaking down a type of barrier. Eventually, just one of those sperm will manage to wiggle its way through the barrier and into the egg cell. And when this happens, the tail drops off the sperm and a special sort of chemical force field prevents any other sperm from joining with this egg cell. The two cells fuse. They join together, they melt together, and they create a new cell. And this new cell almost immediately begins to multiply and to divide. So after just 12 hours, we're looking at a whole bunch of cells. To me, it looks a little bit like a soap bubble. But some of these cells will develop into all different parts of our baby. Some of these cells will develop into the support system the baby needs to grow and develop for that 40 or so weeks inside the mum's uterus. This is just the very, very beginning of that whole process. You know, as that baby starts to grow inside the mum's body or the body of the person with the uterus, it will continue to multiply and divide right throughout that time. And at the very, very beginning, it doesn't really look like a baby at all. Firstly, it takes about four or five days for that ball or that cluster of cells to travel down the fallopian tubes and implant itself into the wall of the uterus. You might remember the wall of the uterus is thick and spongy because it created that safe place for the baby to grow. When we have our baby first, first starting to grow, we don't call it a baby. We call it an embryo. And in those very, very earliest days, sometimes that ball of cells, that cluster of cells can separate and divide into two separate clusters of cells. Now, if these both go on to grow and develop and implant in the wall of the uterus, you might have identical twins. But you know, some babies are born that are not identical twins. They're called fraternal twins. And when this happens, instead of just one, egg cell being released from the ovary and traveling down the fallopian tubes, there might have been two, sometimes three or four or even more. And each of those egg cells is fertilized by a different separate sperm cell. And the babies grow and develop in the same way, but there may be two or even more inside the mom's uterus. So identical twins are very much the same. They grow from the same sperm and the same egg cell. Non-identical or fraternal twins will develop from separate eggs and separate sperm cells. 
by 36 hours, that ball of cells, the one that looked a little bit like a soap bubble, has put itself on the journey down to implant in the wall of the uterus by day four. At this stage, it's called a blastocyst. And it's just a mass of hundreds and hundreds of cells. And some of those will grow into organs. Some of them will grow into bones. Some of them will grow into hair and skin. And some will grow into a support system for the baby that is called the placenta. And we'll have a talk about that one in just a minute. Are you ready to see another really incredible photo? I love showing these ones to you. Now this photo up here is a little baby that's been growing for just four weeks. To me, it looks a little bit like a seahorse. You can see that this little baby looks as if it's got a tail. And believe it or not, we've all still got this little tail because it's actually the end of the spine. We call it the tailbone. Babies are growing incredibly rapidly, incredibly quickly over these first weeks. And from four weeks to five weeks, it is just about doubled in size. So by five weeks, this embryo is about the size of a single green pea. Now you can see this is where the head is going to be. This is where the bottom is going to be. This funny little bit here is the baby's heart. How amazing is that? The most important organs, the spine, the brain, the heart, are the first to start to grow. You'll also see a little tube that's starting to appear outside of this baby, this embryo. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. It's called the umbilical cord. And the umbilical cord is basically the supply line. The supply line that our baby who now has a bottom, now has a heart, now has a brain, it's even got the little stubs that are going to grow into arms and legs. And this supply line is going to bring all the baby's nutrients, the food it needs, all the oxygen the baby needs through the umbilical cord. It's attached to the baby at the part that most people call the belly button called the umbilicus. The other end, it's attached to this really, really interesting organ here. Now this is called the placenta. And the placenta is the food factory. Everything the mum eats, drinks, breathes in, goes through her body to the placenta that will filter so that it can send nutrients and oxygen to the baby through the bloodstream for the whole 40 weeks that it's inside the mum's body. So that's our baby in the first month at about the time that a mum might be thinking, I wonder if I'm pregnant. I haven't had my period this month. I'm starting to notice some of those different signs. You know, by just six weeks, a baby has already started to grow elbows fingers, feet. At this same age, the teeth are already starting to develop under the gums. The face is changing so that the ears, the eyes, even the tip of the nose start to appear. By 11 weeks, all of the organs have formed. This baby has every body part it will have for the remainder of the time it's within the mother's uterus. By this stage, the 32 teeth buds are in the jaw. All the oxygen, all the nutrients are coming to our baby through the umbilical cord. And this is an incredible photo. You might be able to see there the different blood vessels in the umbilical cord attached to the baby at one end, attached to the placenta at the other end here. Now this little baby, if it was a female baby, a baby that had ovaries, would already have a lifetime supply of egg cells stored in the ovaries. If this was what we call a little boy baby, the testicles would be up here inside the body in the same place as the ovaries might be if we were calling this a girl baby. 
and they would stay there until it's closer to the time for this baby to be born. This umbilical cord, which provides the nutrients and the oxygen, also takes away the waste products. So the blood comes in, travels around the baby's body, and then it goes back to the uterus, sorry, to the placenta to be filtered and cleaned. Now, the other amazing thing about this photo here is that you can see that our baby is inside a bubble. This bubble is called the amniotic sac. It's full of fluid and the amniotic fluid is warm, so it keeps the baby at a constant temperature. And it's also there to cushion and protect the baby so it doesn't get bounced around too much inside the uterus. This baby will constantly swallow and pee out and swallow and pee out that fluid for the whole 40 weeks or nine months that they're inside the mum's uterus. Okay, do you know by 17 weeks of pregnancy, not even halfway yet, the baby will have eyelids that are complete and they'll cover the eyes. The eyes don't actually open until about 26 weeks of pregnancy. They're fused closed to protect the baby because it is in that bubble of water for that whole time. Now, if you ever stayed in the bath or the shower or the swimming pool for too long, you might notice that you get really, really wrinkled fingers and feet. You'd think that would happen to a baby because they've been in this bubble of water for the whole time. But in fact, it doesn't happen to babies because their skin actually produces what we call a very, very creamy substance called vernix and this vernix protects their skin and the next photo I've got is a baby that's been growing for five months it's a really funny interesting photo you know by this stage lots of mums will be able to feel that baby moving around inside their uterus it will be very very active it'll be doing somersaults It'll be doing kung fu kicks. It might even be doing a little bit of disco dancing. So at first it feels a little bit like butterflies inside the birth person's tummy. But in fact, it is the baby's movements starting to be felt. Remember, this baby does not breathe like you and I do. This baby's lungs are filled with water and the oxygen is coming through the umbilical cord into the bloodstream and traveling around the body that way. By five months, we've got our little baby here with some of this vernix built up on their eyebrows. So they do look a little bit funny. This baby is fully formed, fully developed. It can respond to smell, it can respond to taste, to sound. It is often sucking its thumb. It is swallowing the amniotic fluid as well. It has fingernails. It has toenails. This baby already has its own unique fingerprints. By five months, the eyebrows and eyelashes have grown and this baby will be very, very active. If someone put their hand onto the front of the mum's body, they might be lucky enough to feel that baby moving around as well. So that's five months. And remember the whole pregnancy takes about nine to 10 months or 40 weeks. By about 30 weeks, the baby is taking up a lot of the space inside the mum's uterus. This baby at this stage would sleep for between 30, 90 and 95% of the time because while the baby is sleeping, it's building up body fat. It's also practicing muscle movements such as the ones we use when we breathe. So sometimes if we have a look at that baby inside the uterus, it might look as if they're breathing. It might look as if they're crying or dreaming or smiling because they're using all those muscles. So from 36 to about 40 weeks, the majority of babies in that crowded uterus that's running out of space have turned around so that their head is facing 
down ways inside the birth person's body. This is because the head is the biggest and the heaviest and the hardest part of the body. So it's optimal, it's best for that part of the body to come out of the mum first. Towards the end of the pregnancy, the placenta starts to absorb a lot of that amniotic fluid that the baby's been floating around in. Some babies are going to keep their parents waiting. They're not going to be born even at 40 weeks. It might be 42 weeks or even longer. Some babies are going to come earlier. They haven't been able to wait and they might be born premature, which means they're born before 37 weeks of pregnancy. Occasionally when a baby's born early, it will need some extra care and to stay perhaps in the hospital for a longer time until it's ready to go home. I wonder how the mum knows when it's time for that baby to be born. You know, often the things that the mum might feel are some little squeezes or some little contractions that will be happening within the uterus. And these contractions or these squeezes start off soft and light. And over time, they get harder and they get closer and closer together. Often, but not always, those contractions can pop the bubble, the amniotic sac that the baby's floating around in. And the mother might say, oh my goodness, my waters have broken. It's a funny thing to say, isn't it? And what it means is there's some water coming out of the mum's body through her vagina, and it might be just a trickle, 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 trickle that happens for a very long time, or it might be a great big whoosh splash. Now I've got here one of my resources I use at school, and what we've got is a baby, and the baby's curled right small because the uterus has got as big as it can get, and it's quite tight in there. As the contractions happen, the vagina, this part here, which leads to the cervix, begins to shorten. The cervix starts off as a tiny, tiny opening that very gradually, it might take hours or even days, dilates until it's 10 centimetres in diameter. And that's enough room for a baby's head to travel through the cervix into the vagina, which we can call the birth canal, and our baby very gradually, perhaps over hours or even longer, will start to make its way out that very, very stretchy tunnel, which is the vagina. And eventually the baby's head is born. And the baby will turn around, I'll show you a photo in just a minute, and then one shoulder gets born, and then the other shoulder gets born, and eventually the baby is delivered and often lifted up onto the mum's tummy. At this stage, the umbilical cord is still attached to the uterus inside the mum's body. Now I'm going to show you a photo of a baby being born head first. But not all babies come out head first. Some babies, even born vaginally, might come out bottom first. And that can give people a little bit of surprise. That's called a breech birth. Birth happens when the uterus, that very, very strong, stretchy muscle, starts to contract. And as it contracts, it pushes the baby out through the vagina. And there it is. And the baby's delivered onto, here's the baby coming out, here's the baby being delivered onto the mum's body. So she's sitting there and holding the baby. It, okay, this one came out head first, but it could have come out bottom first as well. You know, it's hard work giving birth and it's hard work being born. The squeezing and the pushing of the uterus and the journey down the birth canal or the vagina helps to force the fluid that's been inside the baby's lungs out of their body. Now, of course, some babies don't come out through mum's vagina. and You might know that you were born in a different way. You may have been born in a way that is called a caesarean or a caesarean section, 
Some people say C-section. And when babies are born through a cesarean or a C-section, and I have another one of my props here, what happens is in a hospital, a special doctor will make an opening in the front of the mum's body. So they may do an operation to make that opening. Mum might be asleep or she may have had some special medicine to make sure that it doesn't hurt. And the baby is removed through the opening in the front of the mum's body. And here comes our little baby. And this little baby again is still attached by the umbilical cord to the placenta. During a caesarean birth, the placenta is removed when the baby is removed from mum's body. Through a vaginal birth, after the baby is born, over time the uterus continues to contract until oops, the placenta is also removed. And once the placenta is out of the mum's body and has stopped pulsing, has gone light in colour, a special clip is put on the umbilical cord. The umbilical cord is cut, doesn't hurt, doesn't bleed. And the baby is left with a little clip that takes about one week to 10 days to dry up and shrivel up and fall off their body. Very often when a little baby is born, they start to cry. They've gone from a warm, quiet, dark uterus out into bright lights, cold air, lots of noise. When they start to cry, air rushes into their lungs and they'll no longer need the oxygen or the nutrients that come down through the umbilical cord. Once the baby is breathing on its own, so here we have a brand new baby, seconds old, still has the umbilical cord attached. Once that baby cries, once oxygen enters its lungs and it's breathing on its own, we put the little clip on the cord and the cord's cut and this is the part that's left on the baby's body. And of course, when that falls off, this is going to be the belly button. This is the exact same baby at just minutes old and a little bit later on after it's been checked over and after it's been born as well. Do you know, some babies, as I said, are born a little bit early. And if a baby's born a bit early, they may go off to a special care nursery and be put into a particularly specially designed crib that's designed to mimic the environment inside the uterus. So it's warm in there, it's moist in there, it's quiet. They usually cover it so it's a little bit dark as well. So the baby can have a little bit longer in the hospital to continue to grow and to continue to get a little bit fatter and a little bit stronger before it's time for it to go home. Now, of course, once a baby's born, they need to have food. And babies are born with no teeth. They're up inside the gums, but they don't develop for those first few months. So for a little while, that baby will only be able to have fluid or liquid. Now, some birth people choose to give the baby a bottle with special milk called formula in it. And other birth people will choose to breastfeed their baby. So during pregnancy, the hormones that are released encourage the breasts to develop a milk supply and that milk supply is available for the baby to latch onto the nipple and be able to have the mother's or the birth parent's milk at any time. I'd love it if you can have a talk to your grown-ups and find out if they know any stories about when you were born. They might know how much you weighed or where you were born or whether you were a vaginal birth or whether you were a cesarean birth. They might tell you if you were conceived via sexual intercourse or IVF, or maybe a surrogate carried you inside their uterus. Another person donated their uterus and carried that baby around for the whole time. Maybe someone donated or gave some sperm to help you get started. There are so many exciting and interesting and different birth stories. 
I hope you've enjoyed these videos. Please let me know. I'll hopefully come back and talk to you again some other time. Thanks for watching. Bye.